All right, so today we will start with 1.6, which is the transformation uh, of functions. So we want to start by recognizing common graphs. Uh, we want to talk about how we're going to shift these common graphs vertically, horizontally. Uh, we're going to do reflections. Uh, we're going to do stretching and shrinking. And you're going to find out that I have a real big issue with the words stretching and shrinking. I want to say stretching and shrinking. So uh, just kind of ignore me when that happens. Uh, everybody will giggle a few times and we'll get over it, okay? Uh, we want to use horizontal stretching, stretching and shrinking to graph functions and graph functions that involve doing more than one thing. So maybe we'll do a horizontal, a vertical, and some kind of stretch. So that's what we're doing today. The seven functions that we frequently encounter in pre-cal are going to be things like uh, a constant, like f of x equals 2, you know, something like that. That's a horizontal line. f of x equals x, just a straight linear line. Uh, the absolute value of x, x squared, square root of x, cube of x, and the cube root of x. So we want to know what all of these graphs look like. So we're going to start with a constant. It's a horizontal line. All right, so any horizontal line is just a constant function. We can move that up and down by adding something to it. Like if I had equals, you know, y equals 1, and I want to move it up 1, I could just say y equals 1 plus 1. That makes it 2, and it's, of course, up higher, right? So we can move things. We can manipulate things a little bit. Uh, the domain of this function, notice, is what arrow to arrow. Therefore, it's negative infinity to positive infinity. The range is just the value, c, right? It has no other value on the y-axis other than what it is. Uh, it's constant. It's not increasing or decreasing. And it's uh, an even function because it has y-axis symmetry. And that makes sense. We know that it's an even function. We know uh, a constant is even. Now, f of x equals x. This is just a line, a straight line that goes through the origin uh, it's a perfect diagonal line. What does our domain look like here? We still got arrow to arrow, right? When we go left to right, so our domain is still going to be negative infinity to infinity. What about range? What does our y value look like? Yeah, same deal, right? If I start at the bottom, I get an arrow. I go to the top, I've got an arrow, so I'm still looking at negative infinity to positive infinity. Now, it's increasing over the entire domain. Right? It starts low, goes high. It doesn't turn around and do anything. Uh, it's an odd function because it's got origin symmetry. Notice that anything that's positive over here is negative over here. That's kind of the rule for a, an odd function. And it makes sense because x to the first power, anytime we have an odd exponent, it's going to be an odd function. Now we have the absolute value function. One thing we know about the absolute value is that it can't be what? Can't be negative, right? So when it hits zero, instead of going down into the negative range, it has to bounce back up and stay positive. So that's why we get this little v. Now, what is this going to look like in terms of our domain? Negative infinity to positive infinity. And what about the range? What is the lowest point it can be? Zero and going up to what? infinity, right? It's going to include zero because it doesn't have a hole, so we get a bracket. Now notice here we're going to be decreasing over part of it. We're going to be increasing over part of this function. So we start by going down, so we're going to decrease from negative infinity to zero, and then at zero we're going to bounce back and start increasing from zero to infinity. These are not, and, and you know, people are writing all this down. You don't have to scramble to make sure you've got all of this stuff because it's kind of some of it you just look at it and you can tell what it is. Uh, it's an even function. Okay, Absolute value is an even function. Now we've got x squared. x squared is a parabola. What are we looking like for our domain here? Right, arrow to arrow, right? So we're looking at negative infinity to positive infinity. Once again, with our range, just like with the absolute value, we start at zero and go up. Just like with absolute value, we're decreasing from negative infinity to zero and increasing from zero to positive infinity. And just like the absolute value, x squared is an even function. 
now we're going to get into something that's outside of what we're used to doing, and that's going to be the square root function. Now, our square root function has a, a few things that are interesting about it. We know that we can't take the square root of a negative number, right? That means we can't have anything where x is negative. That's why we have nothing over here on the graph. And if we take the square root of a number, we know that number is going to have to be positive, right? Because I can't multiply two numbers together and get a negative number. Therefore, all of our values have to be in the first quadrant. We can't have anything down in that second or in that fourth quadrant. Now, our domain, because we can't take the square root of anything that is less than zero, has to start at zero and go to infinity. Can we take the square root of zero? We can, because zero times zero is zero, zero, you know, is its own perfect square. So that's okay. We can take the square root of zero. We just can't take the square root of anything less than zero. Okay? Now the range on this case also going to start at zero and go to infinity. It's increasing over that entire domain from zero to infinity. And notice that when we do increasing and decreasing, we don't put brackets. We always use parentheses because at the point itself, it's neither increasing nor decreasing. Now, is this even, odd, or neither? Yeah, it's got to be neither because it can't have symmetry because it doesn't have anything on either side. You know, It's got to have something on both sides to have uh, symmetry. So since it doesn't have any kind of symmetry, it is neither even nor odd. So now we're going to jump over to our cube function, x cubed. This is squiggle de line. -y. And notice we are negative infinity to positive infinity still on our domain, also negative infinity to positive infinity on our range. We are also increasing over this entire function. I know it looks like it's got a constant there in the middle. It looks like it horizontals out, but it doesn't. It's always just gradually increasing until it goes back up. So a cube function, even though it looks like it has a constant in the middle, doesn't. It's always increasing. Now, are we got any kind of symmetry here? Is it even, odd? Yeah, it's going to be odd because it's got origin symmetry, right? It's got the same in the first quadrant and the fourth or uh, third quadrant. Plus, it's x cubed, which is an odd exponent, right? So we know that odd exponents are odd functions. Now we have the cube root of x. Now, with cube roots, unlike square roots, we can take the cube root of a negative number because a negative times a negative times a negative is still negative. So we don't have to worry about domain restrictions, so we'll have negative infinity to positive infinity in our domain. Our range, I want to show you all something. I want to point this out because it may pop up in the homework. When you do the range, we're coming up here. You hit an arrow, right? The arrow looks like it's going this way, but it's still kind of going down, too. We don't want to, just remember, if you hit an arrow, that always means towards infinity, whether either in the negative or positive direction, okay? Even if it looks like it's going one way or the other, it's still infinity, okay? So this looks like it's going to be negative infinity to positive infinity for the range as well. Once again, we're increasing everywhere. So increasing from negative infinity to infinity, and it is an odd function. All right, so we've done constant, x, uh, absolute value of x, square, square root, cube, cube root. Those are the seven basic functions that we want to talk about. Now, from here on out, we can talk about how to manipulate them and make them look the way we want them to look. So we're going to start with vertical shifts. We're talking about moving things up and down. To add something, or to uh, move something up and down, all we're going to do is add a number to it. Okay. So if we've got plus a number, that's going to tell us that we have a vertical shift. If you tar start with this graph and add C, that's just going to move it up C units. If you subtract C, that's going to move it down C units. So if, if we're adding a number to it, it's an upshift. If we're subtracting a number, it's a downshift. Okay? 
we're going to use the graph of the absolute value of x to graph the absolute value of x plus 3. Now we know what the absolute value of x looks like. It's a V. This should be one of those basic shapes that we memorize. So we can always draw just an absolute value graph. Now, if I want to do the absolute value of x plus 3, what do I do? What does that plus 3 mean? Right. I'm just, I'm just shifting everything up 3 units. Okay. So instead of starting at the origin, we would start at 3. And everything is still going to be the same. So you just wind up with this graph, which would look you know, more impressive if it were can see that it truly is the exact same graph, just moved up a little bit. Don't have our arrows. And this is, I mean, this is an easy example, but this really is the heart of what we're doing with, with all these translations. We're going to look at the base graph and say, well, are we shifting it? Are we shifting it up, left, right? Are we making it bigger, making it smaller? So if we want to do a horizontal shift, this means that we have to actually affect the x, okay? We have to say the function itself is being added to, not, or not the function itself, that's the other way. We're plugging in x plus a number or x minus a number, and that's going to give us our shift. It doesn't make as much sense when we look at it this way. It's going to make a lot more sense in just a second when we look at an example. But the thing here to remember is if we add a number to x, then that's going to be a left shift. Okay, it's kind of backwards from what you would think. You always think plus means going to the right. In this case, if we add a number, it means we shift to the left. If we subtract a number, that means we shift to the right. Okay, now, what does that mean? Notice here we've got the absolute value or the uh, square root of x. If we want to do the square root of x minus 4, now notice this 4 is being subtracted from x. It's not being subtracted from the square root of x. I want you all to recognize the difference between the square root of x minus 4 and the square root of x minus 4. Okay? Do you see the difference? I mean, it's easy to see that they look different, but do you understand what the difference is? Here, this 4 is being subtracted inside the function. Okay? It's part of what's inside. It's inside parentheses. It's under a radical. It has to do with the x. It's associated with the x. Okay? If it's associated with the x, the x is the left right. So that's going to tell us that it's a horizontal shift. Here we've got the square root of x minus 4. We're just subtracting a number from the original function. Okay? So what is the original function? The original function is y. Right? f of x just means y. So if we're just taking y and adding or subtracting something from it, that's when we get a vertical shift. Okay? So one is affecting the y, one is affecting the x. And you can kind of see whether we're going to be a horizontal or a vertical shift. So in this case, since it's inside the radical, that tells us it's affecting the x. Therefore, it's going to be a horizontal shift. Now, since it's x minus 4, remember this is the one where we don't, we kind of do the opposite. So since it's minus 4, that means we're going to add 4, which means we're going to shift to the right. Okay. So if we look at this graph, the absolute value or the uh, square root function looks like this. But now we just want to shift it over four units. Okay? So you're gonna look like this. Does that make sense? Okay. Right, you're saying that x minus 4 means I have a shift of 4 units, and since it's minus 4, that means I'm going to the right. So if I started at 0, now I'm going to start at 4. And I'm going to have the exact same graph, just shift it over 4 units. Does this make any sense? Well, that's what I'm saying. That's the, that minus sign is, you have to think about it backwards. Because what am I saying? If I want that to be 0, what is x going to have to be? 4. Therefore, it's a shift to the right. Correct. Because all of our graphs have something to do with the origin, right? 
with the exception of maybe the constant function. Y equals X always goes through the origin. Y equals X squared always has a vertex at the origin. X cubed goes through the origin. All of them do something at the, at the origin. So we can use the origin as our you know, shift point. All right, now we want to talk about reflection. Well, before we do reflection, I want to ask you all a question. If I wanted to graph y equals x plus 3, and I want to do it using these methods that we're talking about. I mean, I can graph x plus 3 fairly easily because I know how to do it, but if I wanted to start with our basic function of y equals x, so I know it looks like this, right? And I want to say plus 3. Now, does this 3 affect the x or the y? Yeah. It's a good question, right? Because it can be either one, really. You can perceive it as being the, the x or the y. If it's the y, that just tells us we're going to shift it up three units, right? So we would shift this one, two, three units up. If it's on the x, what does that tell us? It'll shift to the left three units. So one, two, three. But guess what? Same line. So for a linear one, you can really think of it as being affecting the y or affecting the x. Either way, it's still going to give you the same line. Because it's plus. You always change that sign. If it's positive, you go to the left. If it's negative, you go to the right. You just have to get that in your head. It's just the way you do it. Because what we're looking at is, how do we make this function go to zero? If x plus 3 equals zero, what does x have to be? Negative 3. Oh. So we're always having to do the opposite sign because we're trying to get back to zero. OK? But I wanted to show you the linear one so that you recognize that if you can't tell whether it's affecting the x or y, it's probably either one. OK? Everything else will generally have parentheses or have a radical that you'll be able to tell whether it's affecting the x or the y. All right? All right, so when we talk about reflections, we're talking about just flipping everything. This is kind of that, that symmetry. So the graph of negative y is the graph of y reflected across the, the x-axis. So I'm going to take all of my y values and make them negative. So that just means I'm taking everything that's on the top of my graph and flipping it to the bottom of the graph, or everything that's in the bottom and flipping it to the top. And this is called x-axis symmetry. And this happens when I make the entire function negative. Okay? Not a piece of it, but the entire function has to become negative. Reflection about the y-axis happens when I make the x negative. Only the x becomes negative. Okay? So if I can negate the x, that's going to switch everything in my positive x's are going to become negative x's. So I'm going to have y-axis symmetry, okay? Or reflection about the y-axis. So let's look at a couple of examples here. Here we've got the cube root of negative x, okay? Is that negative sign inside the function with x, or is it outside affecting the entire function? Right, this one, the way it's written, is on the inside, right? So that's negative x instead of positive x. So that tells us that we're going to have reflection about the y-axis. So if we take this, this is our traditional cube root of x. So I'm going to take that, and I'm going to flip it across the y-axis, right? So here's the y-axis, so it's going to look like this now. I just took it and everything that was over here, I flipped it over there. Everything that was over here, I flipped it over here. Does that make sense? And I did that because the minus sign is inside only affecting the x. But here comes an interesting thing. Could I not just rewrite that as negative cube root of x? Because that minus sign, the cube root of negative 1 is just negative 1. So I could pull the minus sign out. Now, is it affecting the function or is it affecting the x? It's affecting the function itself. So this tells us that it's going to have x-axis symmetry, which means anything up here, I'm going to reflect down here, and any, 
and anything over here, I'm going to flip over here. But notice you get the same graph either way. So this one has both x-axis and y-axis symmetry because the minus sign can be seen to be either affecting the x or affecting the y. I know that's super confusing. So let me ask you one question. Say I have y equals negative x squared. Okay? So x squared normally looks like this. It's a parabola, right? Here we have the negative affecting the x, right? So it's affecting the x, which means we're going to have y-axis symmetry. Well, what happens with y-axis symmetry? That means anything over here is going to come over here, and anything over here is going to come over here. I just wind up with the same graph, which makes sense because what's negative x squared? Positive x squared. So those two graphs look the same. So if it's got its own symmetry built in, you can't even see it, okay? There's a lot of these examples where things get a little weird, but it's not so much weird as it's just a byproduct of mathematics. All right. Now comes the part where people get confused. And that's when we start talking about sh stretching and shrinking. The way I think about this is we're going to talk about vertical stretch. This is what happens when you multiply some constant times our function. So if I've got 3x plus 4, I multiply 2, now I've got 6x plus 2. That tells me that I multiplied a constant by the entire function, and that's going to give me a vertical stretch. Now, when we do a vertical stretch, what that really does is it pulls it and makes it thinner. Okay? So remember, if you pull something, it's kind of like taffy. It's just going to make it thinner. If you pull it this way, it's going to make it fatter. So a stretch makes it fat, and a, a stretch... Uh, hold on. A stretch makes it uh, thin, but if you compress it, it's going to just make it fatter. So if you make it something shorter, it gets fatter. If you pull it taller, it makes it skinnier. You know, there's the old joke that I'm not overweight, I'm under tall. That's what it is. If I stretch my, if I become seven foot tall, I'll be awesomely thin, right? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about a stretch or a shrink. Now, we stretch when the C or the number that we multiply our function by is greater than one, okay? So that tells us that we're multiplying a number times our function. Our function is y. So if I multiply two times our function, that means it's going to become twice as big. So it's going to become twice as tall. If our number is less than one, say it's a half, if I multiply by one half, that's just going to shrink in half. Okay, so that, that's how we tell whether it's a stretch or a shrink, is whether that number is greater than one or less than one. Say you've got the absolute value of x, and you want to obtain the graph of two times the absolute value of x. Okay? Well, we know that the absolute value of x is this v. Well, 2 on the outside means that I am multiplying the entire function by 2. That tells us it's going to be a vertical stretch, right? I'm making it bigger because the number is bigger than 1. So all I'm going to do is make it thinner. I'm pulling it, making it thinner. And the reason that I make sure and stress that it's making it thinner is because when you graph it, if I've got a V, how do I make it thinner? I just pull, no, you don't spread it out. That's going to make it fatter. You bring, you bring it in, right? And that's going to make it thinner, thinner and taller, okay? And it's easier to see it that way as thin as opposed to being stretched out. And what you'll see is a vertical stretch is a horizontal shrink. And a horizontal stretch is a vertical shrink. They wind up being kind of the same thing. So anytime we have a vertical stretch, horizontal shrink. Horizontal stretch, vertical shrink. Okay? If I make something wider, it becomes shorter. If I make something taller, it becomes thinner. So these have a relationship with each other. So here, since we're talking about it being 
a vertical stretch, that means it's going to be thinner. It's going to come in. Okay? These are all sketches. None of this is, I, I, would, I wouldn't say graph absolute value. I would say sketch the graph of because sketching is what we're doing. These, none of this is exact. There are no numbers on this graph, right? So it's easy to see that what these numbers mean are just stretches and shrinks, not the exact amount of the stretch or the shrink. I'm not so much concerned about that at this point, okay? If I wanted you to graph it, I would tell you to graph it and plug points in and you'd need you know, values, but I don't care about graphing. We're just talking about sketching. So here we have the horizontal stretching and shrinking. And like I said, a horizontal shrink happens when that C is greater than 1 because that's the same thing as a horizontal stretch. Same thing with the vertical stretch. It's the same thing as a horizontal shrink. So it happens when our C is less than 1. Okay. Now, notice here, we're talking about affecting the X, not just the function itself. But we can do that with either one. If I've got a number affecting the inside, I can always factor it out. But if I'm saying that 2 times X plus 3, I can factor that 2 out and still wind up with a linear function that I can uh, graph. So the, the vertical and horizontal stretching is not so much important that you recognize whether it's a horizontal or a vertical stretch shrink, but whether it makes the graph thinner or fatter. Okay. So here, we have got in this one three different translations that we're going to do. Okay. Is there a number that is affecting the X? Yes, that minus 1 tells us we're going to shift what direction? To the right one unit, okay? Do I have a number that's not affecting the x that's just being added? Yeah, the 3. So what are we going to do there? Yeah, we're going to go up 3. And are we going to have any kind of uh, stretch or shrink? Yeah, we've got a positive 2 on the outside, which means that we're vertically stretching, right? So we're going to make it thinner than normal. So our normal graph here is x squared. That square right there tells you what your base graph is. So we know our base graph is just a parabola x squared. But we want to take this parabola, and we're going to shift it first to the left, then up, and then we're going to make it thinner. OK? So we go up 3, right 1 and then we make it thinner. Okay? Notice, I still have no numbers on my graph, so this is still just a sketch. But that's all we're doing. We're looking at each one of these steps and saying, well, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. Each one of them is a very specific type of translation. Okay? Now, if you wanted to graph this and actually graph it with values, I know that 0, 0, <coughs> negative, negative 1. So you've got 1, 1, and negative 1, 1. I know these points are going to be on there, right? That's three points that I can guarantee are always going to be on x squared. So if I want to actually graph this, I can move those three points according to our you know, translation. So we need to go up 3 into the right 1. So I know I'm going to go up 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. So that would be up 3. Then we're going to move to the right 1. So then we do that. Now, our issue becomes how do we make it the correct amount of thin? And the way we're going to do that is, interestingly enough, this number will generate kind of a slope of our parabola, okay? If I go here, I'm going to show you something. If I start at 0, 0, the next point will be 1, 1, right? Because 1 squared is 1. And then 2 will be 
2, 4, because 2 squared is 4. And then 3 will be 3, 9. 4, 16, right? These are the x and the x squared. What is the slope between 0 and 1? I went up 1 over 1, right? So from here to here is a slope of 1. What about from 1, 1 to 2, 4? Here I go up 3 over 1. The next one I go up 5 over 1. Then I go up 7 over 1. Then I go up 9 over 1. Then I go up 11 over 1. It's just a series of odd numbers. We start with 1, do 3, do 5, do 7. And this is what's called a slope progression for a parabola. This 2 will just change the slope progression by multiplying all those numbers by 2. So instead of 1, our first number, we get 2. And instead of 3, our first number, we get 6. And instead of 5, we get 10. We're just going to multiply each one by that number. So if I move my origin up 3 over 1, and then I use the 2 to tell me my slope progression, I'm going to go up 2 over 1, up 2 over 1, then I'm going to go up 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, over 1, up 6, over 1, and I can see how thin my parabola is. Because if it were up 1 over 1, it would be a wider graph, and then up 3 over 1. So you can see that it got thinner by using that new slope progression. Okay, And we'll talk a lot more about that when we actually do parabolas. I just wanted to show you you know, kind of a, an exposure to it. All right, any questions on translations of graphs? Every time I'm in class and that sound happens, I want to think that it means that somebody got it. You know, it's like the light bulb going off, but I don't know whether it is or not. All right, so let's look at combinations of functions and composite functions. We want to start by looking at the domain of functions, uh, not graphs in this case, but actual equations and uh, being able to determine what their function or th what their domains are. We want to combine functions using algebra of functions, so uh, like f of x plus g of x, something like that. Uh, we want to talk about composite functions. Anybody here remember doing composite functions like fog and Goff? That's, that's basically what we're going to do here is fog and Goff. And then determining domains of those composite functions. And lastly, we want to be able to take a look at a function and rewrite it uh, as composition. So we want to be able to determine what f and g are uh, if we compose two functions. So if a function f does not model data or verbal conditions, and its domain is just the largest set of real numbers for which the value of f of x is a real number. If I can plug x in and get a, a y value out, then x is in the domain. Okay? If there's some value I can't plug in for x and get a real number, then that means that number can't be in the domain. Okay? When will this happen? Uh, real numbers that cause division by zero. Can't divide by zero, right? So if there's some x that makes me have to divide by zero, it can't be in the domain. And also, we can't take a negative square root. So any number under a radical that forces me to have a negative number can't be in my domain. So those are the two things that we're going to start looking at when we have functions. If we want to find the domain of this function, 5x divided by x squared minus 49, I have to ask myself, is there a fraction? Is there a fraction? Yes. Is there any way for that fraction to wind up with a zero in the denominator? Yeah. If I set x squared minus 49 equal to zero, I can solve this two different ways. Somebody give me one way of solving this. Add 49 to both sides. That gives me x squared equals 49. And then take the square root of both sides. What's that going to give me? x equals 7, plus or minus, right. Remember, if you use this method, if you take the square root, you always have to do plus or minus, okay? Because a negative number squared is still a positive number. 
So that's one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is to recognize that x squared minus 49 <coughs> is the difference of squares. We can factor it as x plus 7, x minus 7. And if we set each one of those equal to 0, using the principle of zero products, we get x equals negative 7 and x equals positive 7. So what that tells us is that these values, plus or minus 7, are not in the domain of this function. <coughs> Why? Because they make the denominator go to zero. So if I were to ask you, what is the domain of this function? The domain is all real numbers except plus or minus 7. Now how would I write that in terms of interval notation? So all real numbers is negative infinity to infinity, right? So I need to write that, but I need to take out the 7 and the negative 7. So I'm going to say negative infinity to negative 7. I'm going to say negative 7 to 7 and 7 to infinity. Notice what I did here. Those parentheses around the negative 7 means not including. The parentheses around 7 means not including. So I have to come to those points and make a break. And I put this union symbol, the big U, to tell us that these sets are all together. So anytime we're excluding a number, this is how we're going to do it in interval notation. We're going to go negative infinity to the smallest one, smallest one to the next one, next one to the next one, however many there are, making sure to put parentheses on those excluded values. Does that make sense? Okay. And this will pop up in your homework where you have to do interval notation. All right, now when we talk about uh, the algebra of functions. We want to talk about adding functions together. We want to talk about subtracting functions, multiplying and dividing functions. The sum, difference, product, and quotient are still going to give us specific domains uh, that we can deal with. If we add two functions together, then the domain of the new function is just going to be restricted by whatever the domain of the original functions were. If I have no restrictions, then I have no restrictions on the, on the sum. Same way with subtraction. Same way with product. All of these are only dependent on the domains of the two functions that you're either adding, subtracting, or multiplying. Division, however, notice that if I divide two functions, I have the added caveat that that bottom function can't be 0. Okay, And that's the only other difference. Otherwise, the domains are all going to be the same. So let's look at a couple of examples real quick. If we've got f equals x minus 5 and g equals x squared minus 1, okay? Those are our two functions, f and g. We're going to start by finding f plus g. Now, function algebra is just like traditional algebra. You just do it. You take f plus g. You just add them together. So we're going to have x minus 5 plus x squared minus 1, right? It's just f plus g. Does everybody see how easy that is? Okay, we're just adding two functions together. Since this is addition, I can ignore the parentheses, right? I don't have to distribute anything. So I just say x and x squared, uh, and the negative 5 plus negative 1 gives me negative 6. So if I rewrite it in descending order, I just get x squared plus x minus 6. Now, what's the domain of x minus 5? What's the domain here? Is there any restriction there? Do I have a, am I dividing by anything or do I have a square root? No, then my domain for that is going to be all real numbers. What about x squared minus 1? Do I have division? Do I have a square root? No, so the domain for that is going to be all real numbers. So it makes sense that x squared plus x minus 6, which also doesn't have a fraction or a square root, will also have the domain of all real numbers. Okay. Yes, yes. No restrictions. Okay? Now, say we have a composite function. And a fu composite function just means a function inside of a function. So if I say something like x minus 3 cubed. This is x minus 3 is a function, but it's inside the function x cubed. Okay, 
So this is a this is a function that's inside of a function. We call it composition. The domain of a composite function is uh, all the x's such that x is in the domain of g and g is in the domain of f. This makes no sense. It's math speak. Don't worry about it. We'll talk about an example and see what we're talking about. All right. If we've got f of x equals 5x plus 6 and g of x equals 2x squared minus x minus 1, we want to find fog. So we're talking about f of g. So we're going to take g, g is the inner function, and we're going to take it and plug it into f. Okay? That's what we do when we talk about composition. So if this is g, we're going to plug it in anywhere there's an x in f. Because this is f of g of x. Remember, f of something means we take that entire something and put it in. So we're going to say 5 times 2x squared minus x minus 1 plus 6, right? That's 5x plus 6. So we're going to go ahead and distribute the 5. And we're going to get 10x squared minus 5x minus 1. x squared minus 5x minus 5 plus 6, which is going to give us 10x squared minus 5x plus 1. Now, is there any restriction on the x in g? No division, no square root, right? So I'm okay with g being plugged into f. Now, is there anything that makes g of x undefined? No. Therefore, nothing in x and nothing that I can get from g of x that will make f go to 0 or go to 0 in a radical or 0 in a fraction or a negative in a radical. Therefore, we still have no restriction on our domain. So when do we exclude values? If there's something that makes g not a real number, then that's not going to be in our domain. For example, here we've got f of x equals 4 over x plus 2 and g of x equals 1 over x. What is excluded from the domain of f of x? Negative 2, right? Because that's what will make the bottom go to 0. So this is going to be all reals except negative 2. What about g of x? What can the denominator not be there? Can't be 0. x can't be 0. Therefore, it's going to be all reals except 0. OK? So now what I have to look at is let's find fog. So we're going to take g and plug it into f. So we've got 4 over 1 over x plus 2. I'm just plugging 1 over x in for x. So I'm going to solve this by multiplying top and bottom by x. I get 4x over 1 plus 2x. OK? So that is my new function. Now, I know I can't plug in 0 into g. So if there are restrictions on g, they automatically become restrictions on f of g. And then we've got f of g restrictions. So is there anything that will make f of g, which is 4x over 1 plus 2x, is there anything that will make this undefined? What if I set 1 plus 2x equal to 0? Right, I can't have a 0 in that denominator. So that's just going to give me minus 1 divided by 2 
So x can't be negative 1 half. So my g restrictions were 0. My f of g restrictions are negative 1 half. Yes? And honestly, we did this, the f of x, that restriction has no bearing whatsoever on f of g. Okay? Just because f can't be negative 2 does not mean that f of g can't be negative 2 or that g can't be negative 2. The only two restrictions that I really care about when talking about composition are g, which is the inner function, and then f of g, which is the function that I have, you know, created. So for this one, it's going to be negative infinity to negative one half, negative one half to zero, zero to infinity. Okay. Now, does everybody see or at least understand where I got these values from? The 0 comes from g. The negative 1 half comes from f of g. That negative 2 from f does not matter in the least, okay? It's important to recognize that. All right, so now I want to talk about decomposing a function. Now, when we make composite functions, uh, that's called composing. We put one inside of another. To decompose them, we're going to pull it out and express it as two different functions. And generally, this is really easy. Okay, uh, In the homework, it's super easy because they actually tell you one of them and you just have to find the other one. So uh, here, we're just going to look at one and say, anytime I can put something in parentheses, I can change it to an x. Okay. So anything I can write in parentheses, I will make the inner function, g. So in this case, which part of this could I write in parentheses? Somebody just got it. x squared plus 5, right? It's under a radical, therefore it's, it's self-contained. So I can write g as x squared plus 5, just the part that's under the radical or the part that's in parentheses. Now if I pull that out, if I pull the x squared plus 5 out and rewrite it as x, just do a substitution, then that tells me that my f will just be the square root of x. But notice what this gives us. If I wanted to compose this now, what happens if I put x squared plus 5 into x? Well, I just get h, right? And that's, what, that's the goal of this, is to write g as whatever can be written in parentheses or under a radical, and then f will be whatever's left substituting that out as x. So let me give you an example. What if I told you that h of x was equal to 3 times x plus 4 squared minus 7? What would you want to make g be? Yeah, whatever's in parentheses, x plus 4. Then f, we're just going to change the x plus 4 into x and then rewrite it. So 3, x squared minus 7. That's one way of doing it. Now, if I look at this, could I not also put that in parentheses? So I could let g be 3 times x plus 4 squared. If that's the case, what would f of x be? x minus 7. Because you just replace that entire 3 times x plus 4 squared with x. And notice either one of these, if I compose back, if I put this in here, I get 3 times x plus 4 squared minus 7. And if I put this whole thing in for x, I get 3 times x plus 4 
squared minus 7. So this shows you there are multiple ways of decomposing any given function. Okay? Questions, concerns, comments about that? All right. Then we are finished with 1.6 and 1.7. It's a lot to throw at you. It's a lot to throw at you considering some of you still haven't taken your test. Those of you who have not taken your test, make sure and get over there and get it taken. Uh, those of you who have not, try to start looking at this homework. We want to do 1.6 and 1.7 so that you can uh, bring in any questions or concerns you might have on the homework on Wednesday. All right, anybody got any questions before y'all go? All right, we'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>